Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Just a reminder about your mobile devices, if you can do the needful. Apologies from uh, Rachel Woods and uh, Doug Beattie. And Martina as well. Martina Anderson. Um, okay, so there's the draft minutes of the meeting that was held on the 27th of February, uh, pages 5 to 9 of your uh, meeting pack. And if members are content that they are accurate, then I'll sign them accordingly. Content? Content. Right. Okay, so matters arising just on the forward work program. The oral evidence sessions on the legislative consent motions for the Birmingham Commonwealth Games Bill and the air traffic management of unmanned aircraft bill agreed at last week's meeting has been scheduled for the meeting on the 19th of March. Uh, the department has requested that an oral evidence session on the LCM for the private international law implementation of agreements bill be scheduled for the meeting next week on the 12th of March in order to meet with the Westminster timetable. So if <coughs> members are content, we'll schedule that LCM for next Thursday. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. And then just to note the forward work programme on the, any further comments in that respect, we'll note it. Item 4 is the overview briefing on the Criminal Justice Inspection and we will invite officials to come in and come to the top table. Pages 16 to 21 of your meeting pack. Okay, members. Um, so can I just welcome uh, Jackie Durkin, Chief Inspector of the uh, Criminal Justice Inspection for Northern Ireland, and James Corrigan, who is the Deputy uh, Chief Inspector. Um, you're both very welcome to the meeting. Uh, it'll be recorded by Hansard, um, just to make you aware of that. So at this stage, I'm going to hand over to Ms Durkin, and uh, then I'm sure members will have some questions once you've given your briefing. Certainly. Thank you, Thank you. Chair. Um, so thank you for the welcome and invitation to speak to the committee and the opportunity to provide an overview of the role and work of Criminal Justice Inspection Northern Ireland. I hope the committee found the briefing paper helpful and I would like to mention a few key points about who we are, what we do and the future inspection programme before James and I respond to any questions members may have. I was appointed Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice on the 30th of November 2019. The Office of the Chief Inspector was established in 2003 as an executive non-departmental public body under Section 45 of the Justice Northern Ireland Act 2002. Since then, and with the devolution of justice in Northern Ireland, the Inspectorate is now sponsored by the Department of Justice. I am supported by James Corrigan as my deputy, a team of six inspectors and three support staff on a full or part-time basis, drawn from a variety of professional backgrounds including policing, probation, legal and human rights, human resources and business consultancy. I and the CGI team are acutely aware of our independence and impartiality in providing evidence-based inspection reports in individual organisations and agencies and thematic inspections, reviewing topics and issues across the whole criminal justice system. We have good relationships with and rely on expertise, primarily from Her Majesty's Inspectorates in England and Wales, to support particular inspections such as police, prisons, probation and prosecution services. The organisations within our remit to inspect are set out in statute and reach across all aspects of the criminal justice system. They include obvious organisations and agencies such as the Police Service, Prison Service, Public Prosecution Service, Probation Board, Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunals Service, the Youth Justice Agency and the Office of the Police Ombudsman for Northern Ireland, as well as a number of other organisations, for example, Forensic Science, CNI, the Parole Commissioners for Northern Ireland, State Pathologist Department and the Legal Services Agency. I, as Chief Inspector, in consultation with a wide range of stakeholders, am responsible for creating an annual inspection programme for approval by the Justice Minister. I may also be requested by the Minister to undertake particular inspections or reviews in addition to planned inspections. I cannot inspect individual cases or the judiciary, but we do inspect governance, strategy, process, systems and services, whether in individual organisations or thematic reviews crossing a number of organisational boundaries. CJI provides authoritative information and expert opinion to inform the public, 
political representatives and criminal justice system stakeholders about the work and performance of inspected bodies and the criminal justice system as a whole. We seek to identify key risks and challenges, making recommendations focused on securing improvement, promoting cooperation and actively contributing to delivering a better justice system for all in Northern Ireland. We are committed to reporting our findings accurately, with integrity and objectivity, while maintaining a culture of respect and openness throughout our work. We aim to work collaboratively with inspected organisations to secure support for and agree recommendations for implementation and the delivery of better outcomes. CGI reports are laid in the Northern Ireland Assembly and published on our website. Since taking up my appointment, I have met a wide range of leaders in criminal justice, the community and voluntary sector, other inspectorate and regulatory organisations. I've also met the Minister, Department of Justice officials, Attorney General, the Lord Chief Justice, a number of political representatives and other key stakeholders. All have been complimentary about the inspection activity reports and professionalism of CJI. Many have emphasised the importance of CJI's contribution in fostering public confidence in our justice system. I intend to build on that reputation and the valuable contribution an independent and unified inspectorate brings in Northern Ireland. These discussions have also been timely and provided a useful opportunity to listen to views on potential inspection areas or topics. Requests for views and consideration as part of next year's inspection programme. If committee members have any views on the future inspection programme, I am happy to consider them. Since January 2017, CJI has published 19 reports and made strategic and operational recommendations for improvement, which were all accepted. A significant number of recommendations are operational, arising from, for example, prison inspections that also involve HM Inspectorate of Prisons and the Regulation and Quality Improvement Authority. Key persistent strategic issues have included reducing avoidable delay, the experiences of victims and witnesses, tackling domestic and sexual violence and abuse, and effective cross-departmental and service responses to deliver better outcomes. The challenge in addressing these issues is not underestimated, but progress will require meaningful implementation of accepted inspection recommendations. I was pleased to see specific reference to CGI's work in the new decade new approach document and oversight of report recommendation implementation. It is important that inspection reports and accepted recommendations result in action. The arrangements for oversight and governance for effective implementation of inspection recommendations are issues I hope to discuss with the Criminal Justice Board in due course. It is disheartening for inspectors to repeat recommendations and see limited evidence of implementation when revisiting organisations. This is not an effective use of resources for CGI nor the organisations inspected. <coughs> Excuse me. But more importantly, it does not actively demonstrate real commitment to continuous improvement and a better justice system for all. A number of inspections are underway and I know that you will appreciate I cannot comment on current reviews until they are published. However, the committee may wish to be briefed on specific reports following publication and I'm happy to respond to any such requests. In the next few months, I'm planning to publish a number of reports, including a thematic report on child sexual exploitation and another on victims and witnesses that may be of particular interest to the committee. In closing, as I said earlier, I'm currently carrying out extensive consultations to inform the development of a new three-year corporate plan and 2020-21 inspection programme. I would welcome the views of the committee as part of that process at this stage. In due course, the draft corporate plan and inspection programme will be forwarded to the committee for comment. I hope this overview was helpful and James and I are happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jackie. You had mentioned there the uh, recommendations, um, both strategic and then operational, that have been made over the past couple of years. Uh, I think from 2017, it's 90 strategic and 87 operational. Um, how satisfied are you um, that whilst they've been accepted that they're actually being implemented? I noted that you've made some comments about the frustration when that doesn't happen. Do you want to elaborate on that? 
Yes, I think one of the things that I will be working with across different justice organisations will be is to get a handle on what are the governance arrangements for progressing implementation, and that may vary across different criminal justice organisations. I'm also mindful there have been comment about the number of, of recommendations that exist from various sources, um, so I think it will be important to establish as we do through follow-up reviews on particular inspections, what progress there has been against implementation of recommendations. But I think it is timely, and particularly with me coming in new to office, is to discuss with the Criminal Justice Board how the Criminal Justice Board have oversight, particularly for thematic inspections, where there may be not one particular organisation that owns the implementation of a recommendation, but rather they cross organisational boundaries and are pointed at the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. And do you see the Criminal Justice Board as being you know, a kind of agent for that driving force across the criminal justice system? Well, that's part of the conversation I want to have with them to see if they see themselves in that role. Um, I know each organisation, many of whom are operationally independent and fiercely guard that, as I do. But I think it's important that we see how the Criminal Justice Board is operating as a board across the criminal justice system and overseeing progress against those recommendations that are strategic in nature and are not down to one organisation to make happen in their own particular organisation. So I think that's a conversation that will be worth having. And I do appreciate that not only those organisations but the department already have mechanisms for monitoring, um, for overseeing progress. But I think that could vary from organisation to organisation and I think it's worth having a conversation about that. Yeah, it's not one that I'd thought about before. You know, obviously, with every report that's produced, it'll fall to the particular agency within the criminal justice system, but uh, having somebody not above that, but uh, with that strategic role that the board has could, could lend a lot of weight to, to maybe driving through some of the recommendations that might mm -hmm. sit not idly, but maybe just don't get the kind of attention or focus continually that you would need. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important. Um, just, I mean, as I said, our, our recommendations or the discussion goes on with, with organisations, but they are agreed. And the intention is with, you know, when you have an agreed recommendation that there is momentum and action behind them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it will be interesting to see how the Criminal Justice Board um, any views they have about their role in that and how that might be taken forward um, and indeed how they reassure themselves that as a system, the criminal justice system is moving forward with some of those issues that require a combined response regardless of whether there is operational independence, whether it's from the police or the prosecution service um, or the courts and that's a conversation that, that I'm eager to have. Okay. Interesting, thank you. Linda? Thank you, Jackie. I appreciate your um, report. And I think just around the recommendations, that will be something that I, I certainly will be very focused on as well. I get to see reports done that are really good reports with really good recommendations that aren't then followed through and a number of years later. And, and I'm sure all have <coughs> seen this in previous committees, including the Justice Committee, where you have things coming back recommending the same things mm -hmm. because they haven't been followed through. And, and, and you're 100% right. That there's no value in that either for you or, or, or for us or for the agency that you're doing the inspection of. I know just in terms of um, our previous life on the, on the policing board, one of the things that I did do um, on the committees that I was on was ask the officials to pull together all of the recommendations from all different reports, whether they were CJA or, or anybody else, and, and to, for us to then follow them through. What ones were accepted by the police? <coughs> Um, you know, when were they implemented, how were they going to be implemented, the ones that weren't accepted, why? Because some of them was just down to finances, so you needed to not just say these are not going to be done, that needed to be something that you were chasing up at some stage and saying, have you put a business case forward? Do you see this as something that mm -hmm. is, you didn't have finance for last year, but you might ha make it a priority this year? So I think it's really important if we're going to ask people to do reports on things that we then need to follow up on the recommendations. So I think if there is a way of doing that, whether it's through the Criminal Justice Board, whether it's something that um, we or the department or somebody, somebody does need to be, you know, and I think at least within the Policing Board you have the opportunity to do that because you have the different committees that are able to focus mm. on it. But I think then obviously the other justice agencies don't necessarily have that same kind of oversight, but it is vital. 
there, there is no value in them unless unless we do that. Um, just, and I know you can't comment on any specific reports and I wouldn't ask you to, but in terms of timeline, I'm just wondering specifically on the one around the disclosure process, the PSNA disclosure process, have you a timeline for that? And, and that's all I'm going to ask you in relation to it. I'm not going to ask you to comment or put you on the, on the spot. But yes, I do have a timeline and I'm hopeful that certainly within the next month to six weeks we'll, I will be in a position to publish that report. But as I know you appreciate, there's a, a process in terms of mm -hmm. ministerial approval to publish, to go through, finalise that. Um, so as I say, I'm hopeful that certainly um, around Easter time, or if possible before it, we'll, I'll be in a position to publish. Is the report with the PSNA, because I know obviously you do allow you know, the, the agencies to have, have yeah. sight, if, so that they have a, an opportunity to come back and say, well, actually, that's not right, and, and yeah. challenge yeah. whether or not you change what's in it, then yeah. it's, it's entirely up to you. Job, but. Well, there are various stages in which the inspection team would engage with an organisation or organisations if it's a thematic review. I mean, there's a discussion at emerging findings stage. Um, there's also an opportunity for organisations to provide a factual accuracy check on the report. And then at a, a final stage, if it has been a, a, some sort of a delay or for whatever reason in publication, then certainly my practice because of, of um, obviously being a new chief inspector, there was work in hand under the previous chief inspector. So I would be giving, um, in any report, uh, I'll be giving those organisations an opportunity if I've made any changes um, to the report then to give them an opportunity to see it to note before publication rather than re-perform another factual accuracy check. So yes, they will they will see it as as will the Office of Police Ombudsman before publication. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bad teacher. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks for coming in. Uh, CGI did a report some time ago around uh, prisoners uh, and specifically uh, it uh, informed us that Prisoners from a Catholic background were more likely to face disciplinary measures while in prison. And the first question I want to ask is, uh, w when was that report, what report was it, and is there any update on that? Has there been any follow-up on it? And I have a couple of related questions that I want to ask. Uh, the information we have from the... Uh, Justice Minister, is that there are a disproportionate number of uh, prisoners from a Catholic background in the youth justice system, and particularly in, in youth custody. <clears throat> That's one issue. And the second issue is in relation to the makeup of the workforce in the prison system. And Ronnie Armour was in a few weeks ago presenting to the committee and he informed us that only 15% of the workforce come from Catholic background. I'm wondering, would, the, would CJA have any plans to carry out uh, an inquiry into any of those issues that I have raised with you? Well, as I'm sure you can imagine, there's an extensive... Um, Library, if you like, of back inspection reports. So I'm going to hand that question over to James, if, Thanks, if you're content. Um, the issue that you mentioned in, re in relation to differential outcomes for Catholic prisoners, that issue has come up actually in quite a few reports. Um, in terms of prison establishment reports, the ones that we've done on McGabry and McGilligan, um, we've, we've addressed that issue in those reports going back, I would say, over the last seven or eight years. Um, but it also came up in a more recent report, which was published last year, which dealt with equality and diversity across the whole criminal justice system. Um, and in that report, we made a recommendation to the prison service that they needed to better understand why those differentials w was occurring within the prison service. Um, and to be fair to them, they've actually, they have um, taken on board that recommendation um, and they have commissioned research um, from Queen's University in Belfast, and that report was provided to the, the prison service, and, and we, see, we receive a copy of that report. And that does give a better understanding of why those differentials actually are in place. Um, so in a sense, they've acted upon that recommendation that we've made. Um, the second point I want to make in relation to the prison services, we, and we mentioned this in the report, we have been impressed 
with how the prison service have proactively tried to understand the reasons for for those differentials. Um, in fact, they are probably more proactive than most of the rest of the criminal justice system in accepting that they have a problem, but also in trying to understand how they can overcome that problem. So I think that's a positive. Um, in terms of the, the disproportional number of, of Catholics in youth custody, yes, that's, that is a, that's a fact, like, because you only, need to, like, you only need to look at the numbers of, 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 of um, people held in detention and their, and their background. Um, and I think, again, that's probably, I think the research the Queens have done for the prison service would, would probably give an insight in terms of why there is a disproportional number of, of Catholic, particularly young Catholic men within, within, held in detention. Um, and again, that's what, what that's what we've asked them to do. We haven't given the solution in terms of a recommendation. What we asked is that the, the the prison service and the juvenile justice centre and, and others need to better understand why those differentials occur. And in a sense, James, I'm, I'm not blaming the prison system yeah. because they have to take whoever sent to them. Yeah. I'm wondering has any uh, and, and I uh, accept you you uh, have, have have told us that research is being commissioned and the mm. why this is happening. Yeah. But I'm just making it clear I'm not blaming the prison service for that one. Yeah, and of course the prison service, as you know, is the end stage of the criminal justice process. In, in sense, they get they, they receive what is provided to them in terms of the, the, the people that go into the prison service or people that go through the justice system. So in some senses, you need to go back to the beginning of the justice system and look at police investigations um, and, and decision making for the public, public prosecution service and the court service. But actually, to be honest, you need to go back further because you need to go back to understand why there is crime in certain communities and why certain people um, are vulnerable to crime and why there's a higher number of victims in certain communities. And that goes well beyond the criminal justice system. And I suppose that's a feature of a lot of our reports is that actually what we're doing in the criminal justice system is looking at and dealing with the consequences of wider societal issues. Um, and that's why it's so important to have, I suppose, have ourselves and others sort of saying, well, actually, if you really want to tackle these problems, you have to think about a cross the bat mental approach. And, and that gets us into the whole, whole program for government and the, the outcome based approach in terms of the program for government, trying to understand the nature of crime and, 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 and the war, early warning that happens back at sort of preschool age and, and the schooling system and, um, and opportunity, lack of opportunities. And I think that, and that research from Queen's. Tries to, tries to understand some of that background in terms of trying to understand why there is differentials in terms of people within the justice system and why there may also be differential outcomes in terms of some of the decisions that the prison service have taken in terms of, of who is held in prison. Um, the final point you make is in terms of the workforce composition. Um, we've, 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 those figures, we produced those figures ourselves in our, in our most recent report on equality and diversity. Um, and of course, it is a problem for the prison service, but it's a problem, I think, for the wider criminal justice system. And the only point that I would make out, make clear, is, uh, unlike the police, there hasn't been, there wasn't that sort of reform, sort of the investment in reform within the prison service in the way that you had in terms of policing and the patent report and all the subsequent sort of investment in terms of bringing in new recruits. That the prison service essentially did not go through that process, and there was never that investment in terms of of bringing new people in. And I think that's, you know, that can partly understand that. And then the other factor is, it's, you know, it's as you said, like the prison service essentially have to deal with what, what, what wider societal issues. Um, and I think, as you know, there's there's lots of reasons why, particularly people from a Catholic background, are not attracted to a, to a career in, in the prison service. Um, and I think that's just a reality. And I think that it's very difficult for any one organisation to be able to change that reality. And would you expect at any time to do a follow-up on that equality and diversity report? Oh yes, we, we will be coming back to look at those recommendations. Um, we normally do a follow-up review somewhere between one year and two years after the report is published. Um, so certainly we will be coming back. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Gordon Dunn. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for your presentation so far. Do you see yourselves as inspectors or, or auditors, do you feel, in, in the role that you carry out? I think we're very much... Um, aware of, acutely aware of that it's an inspection, um, it's an inspectorate, it's in statute as an inspectorate. Uh, we're not there to do tick and turn audits or financial audits, we're there to do thematic and topic specific or organisational specific inspections and deliver a programme. I think that's certainly what was intended under the legislation. 
We work very closely and where we can collaboratively with different organisations to make sure that what we're doing is adding value to them, that they're aware of what we're going to do and are clear about the terms of reference and where we can to work alongside us. Because I think that way we end up in a situation with a report that is credible and is providing confidence not only to the organisation but to the wider general public about what we looked at and what we found and to make recommendations for real improvement that are capable of being implemented. Um, you could use the term evidence-based inspections. What, what do you mean by that? Well, the evidence that we would gather in the course of inspections can be wide-ranging, depending on the topic. So, as I said at the start, where we need to, we would bring in particular experts in an area, such as prisons or probation. But it also would involve extensive fieldwork. So, it would go out on the ground in the organisation, talking to whether it's employees, whether it's service yeah. users, um, reviewing case files, um, looking at talking to a wide range of people who interact with that service or with that organisation. And that builds up a picture that provides an evidence base in which you can have conversations about where systems, processes, governance or strategy could be made better, ultimately with the outcome that there are improvements and, there are, and it is adding value not only to that organisation but to the wider criminal justice system. Would you not find a lot of the, the organisations are looking uh, looking at or are almost inspected out. There's so many different bodies, mm -hmm. so many uh, different meditation organisations that they're working to, mm -hmm. so you're probably the next one through the door. Mm -hmm. So is there not, do you not think there's a lot of duplication or perhaps as part of your your inspection you, you go and look for, for those reports as, mm -hmm. as part of, of, I suppose, building up uh, confidence and how they, they manage and how they're doing their business. Yeah. I suppose for me, what I would look to is the reasons and the background and the history as to why it was felt Northern Ireland needed a combined, and it is only one in the United Kingdom, a combined um, criminal justice inspectorate and there are particular reasons for that. And I fully accept that some organisations might feel like that. But I see my role and the role of the inspectorate is to shine a light on when there is good practice and when there are things that need to be acknowledged that are being done well, just as much as there are opportunities. So you're looking for compliance and non-compliance? I wouldn't put it as compliance or non-compliance. I would look at, at giving a thorough review and an evidence-based inspection on when things are working as they should, but we're identifying where there are opportunities for improvements. Does it come down to risk then, when you identify a risk? Certainly part of the programme, I see it as being risk-based. I know it's been in the past, and I would obviously would need to continue that, because there will always be issues, I feel, that will arise. There will always be organisations, because of the nature of what they do and the services they deliver, that will carry more risk than others. But there are also developments in the criminal justice system since Inspectorate was created in terms of, of issues and topics that we would be looking at. I mean, some of the work that we're doing, I mentioned earlier about um, a, a thematic review of child sexual exploitation. There's another one underway on modern uh, slavery and human trafficking. Those are issues that even a decade ago we weren't really talking about as a community. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. So how you, uh, you make up your programme Based to take it on, on feedback you've had, on, on topics that have been brought to your attention, obviously risks again, and uh, how do you develop that programme? How do you go about doing that? Well, what I am doing is looking at not only at the, if you like, inspections that we've done previously and where we need to do follow-up yeah, work, yeah. but potentially uh, the programme for last year where we maybe didn't get to start particular inspections yeah. because we were responding to requests from the department and also from my, from my own research and, and reading and learning about what are topical issues in the criminal justice system. But a big part of that is listening to stakeholders yeah. and listening very clearly to what they're saying, the issues are for them, or the persistent issues that, again, Criminal Justice Inspection might have looked at and reviewed and produced a report five years ago or more and needs to be looked at again. So it's a combination of all those factors. But what I would intend to do is to develop a programme and put it out for consultation so the committee and other stakeholders would have an opportunity to comment on that at a later oh, date. Good. The point was made earlier, I suppose, like any 
uh, auditor inspections is about follow-up action and the, the need to, to stop recurrence. Do you feel you have enough authority uh, with, as you're inspected um, to ensure that the issues are addressed, that the recommendations are fully implemented? I know you've mentioned it earlier. Mm -hmm. Do you feel you have enough authority to, yeah. to wield, you know, the, I mean, not the axe, but <laughs> to wield your influence no. to ensure that people follow up on, on the actions? Yeah. Well, what I've been hugely impressed about since I came in to this role was the credibility and the clout that the criminal justice inspection carries among the criminal justice system. And I have no doubt that when we speak, we're listened to. I think there's a number of organisations that are maybe um, more ready to respond to recommendations than others. And again, the challenges of the criminal justice system working as a system Mm -hmm. where it crosses organisational boundaries and, as James mentioned earlier, a lot of the issues that we inspect and our findings, that they're not isolated in justice alone. Their reach is beyond yeah. the justice system. So influencing where you don't have a remit to inspect the department or the judiciary or you don't have a remit to go beyond um, to other departments or other arm's length bodies or agencies of, of other departments, I think certainly that's a challenge. And I think it's something that we need to look to in the future to say, are we truly going to work in partnership and collaboratively uh, across government and across different agencies? Because that's sometimes with some of these issues, the only way we'll ever make a real impact and, and a real difference. Uh, and just if I may pick up on something that you mentioned earlier about the number of recommendations. Yes, sometimes there is duplication. We know there's duplication in some of the findings in our reports, particularly around domestic violence and abuse and sexual violence and abuse. And for instance, some of the recommendations in the Gillen Review are very similar to those. Yeah. We know that there's findings that perhaps the prison ombudsman would find that are very similar to recommendations, if not identical, to some of the recommendations that we would find. But the challenge is to corral those and say, right, well, if we're taking action, how many of these recommendations will it address? It may not be about responding in a separate way to every recommendation, but it's, it's knowing the landscape and knowing the recommendations that are going to have the most impact and the most likelihood of delivering results and making improvements in the system. Thanks very much. Thank you. Paul Thanks, Frey. Chair. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, Jackie, and thank you for meeting with me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was very, very informative, and I wish you all the best in your role. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure you're building up relationships uh, on a daily basis. Uh, you're a non departmental bo public body, but who inspects the inspectorate? Um. Well, I suppose some of it is about self-placing, but I can also say that we are we carry an international accreditation, ISO 9001. James, you'll correct me if I get yeah. this wrong. So we're very rigorous and thorough about making sure that the processes that we adopt are subject to external scrutiny. So we've recently been re-accredited under that international standard. And it's very important to us in all our engagement with our criminal justice organisations, as, as we've discussed in the team, we can't expect of others what we, don't, we aren't visible about and we don't demonstrate ourselves. Um, so we are up for being reviewed by the ISO, uh, through the ISO accreditation process. And I can say with all honesty, I, I don't think there would be any of our criminal justice organisations would shy away from letting me know very clearly if they had any issues of concern about any of the activity or professionalism of the criminal justice inspectorate. And I think it's down to, and I'm very grateful for, um, the professionalism of the inspection team that it allows me to come into a role and to an organisation that carries that level of credibility and reputation in the justice system. There's no doubt about it, you're very well respected. The body's very well respected and feared, I might say, maybe, because you'll get a hit in the media, for sure, and then you'll get uh, uh, one scrutiny, uh, one committee scrutinising your report or, or assessing it, and then obviously making people accountable, even in this room here, on that report. But do you, uh, with regards to all your recommendations, do you ever get real bite back from a minister or a particular part of the department? I think I might pass that one, if I may, to James, because he would have more experience mm. 
with an eye on those particular issues, if you're prepared to confess them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but well, what I can confess is that since um, you've talked earlier about um, 90 strategic recommendations, 87 operational recommendations since the beginning of 2017, every one of those recommendations was accepted by the criminal justice organisations. Mm -hmm. So there is essentially an understanding that they accept the evidence that those inspections is based on, but also that those recommendations are ones that they believe can actually deliver the performance improvement. Um, so I think that's an important point to, to make. That, that, that does not mean that people are comfortable with the recommendations because we operate a risk-based approach to inspection. So we're not necessarily going to be inspecting the areas which are high-performing because the risk-based means you target the areas which need um, improvement. Um, but I have to say, even though people... And I wouldn't say it's fear. I think it's probably... Um, a level of um, possibly concerns, pub issues about pub public issues becoming public mm -hmm. that organisations are, are comfortable about. Because, our, as Jackie says, our reports are published on our website and they obviously are, are, are then scrutinised perhaps by the Justice Committee and, and other committees within the, within the Assembly. So I think people who work in organisations have to, I suppose, defend their organisation against those challenges. So that creates a certain amount of concern. But I wouldn't say it's fear, because we work very closely with the organisations. Um, the recommendations are well known before the reports are published. So it gives organisations an opportunity to develop an action plan and to produce that action plan at the time of the publication. So I would say you know, we, we, we would work in a very collaborative way with the criminal justice organisations. But you're right. We're not there to be a friend of the criminal justice system. We're there to be, essentially, to challenge the justice system and to point out areas that need change and need performance improvement. Um, and if that means there's, you know, there is tension, I, I'm, I'm happy with that because I think there needs to be a certain element of tension between an organisation which is inspected and an organisation that does the inspection. I'm trying to think through my memory, is there ever a time when a department or, an, or part of a department has said that you are wrong? No, they would never. I don't think they would say that we are wrong. They would. Um, they would ask us to verify the evidence on occasion. Um, sometimes they would um, have a different perspective on our judgments. But I think, the, well, generally speaking, it's not a case of right or wrong. It's a case of saying, well, that's that's the view of the inspectorate, but we would have we would take a slightly different approach. But that, but that doesn't mean that they've rejected the report. It certainly doesn't mean that they reject the recommendations because they've accepted the recommendations. But you can still accept the recommendation and think it's wrong, if you know what I mean. Yeah, but I, I think it'd be, it'd be more honest if, if, you didn't, uh, if, you didn't, if you didn't believe the foundation on which the recommendation was based. It would be more honest, and we would actually prefer for organisations to say we don't accept the recommendation. In our job as MLAs and scrutiny, uh, scrutinising MLAs, especially in committees, we come up, up, we come up against a lot of... Uh, challenge with regards to transparency even in ministerial questions it's evening happening now when we're back we're getting answers that aren't answers non-answers what challenges do you face uh, with regards to the challenge on transparency and people trying to well hide hide stuff's too strong a word of course but they will just not give you the information you require or or it's very hard to unknow something yeah. you, to know something that you don't know yeah it's an unknown unknown type yeah. scenario yeah. so how do you actually delve down? And what I'm going to going to challenge you here uh, with regards to building up relationships. Who, who are the worst? <laughs> right. Well, the answer. <laughs> let Jackie maybe think about the worst. <laughs> part, and I'll answer the first part of the question, which is um, in terms of gathering the evidence, and making sure that essentially it is the correct information that we're that we And obviously, we, there is a sort of a, a process of gathering evidence, and that's through interviews, it's through gathering data. But quite, quite recently, in the last number of years, we put a stronger focus on what we call case file reviews. Mm -hmm. So what we do, particularly in the police and in the public prosecution services, we go in and we examine the case files. Um, and we did it for sexual violence, we did it for domestic violence, we've done it at the moment for terms of child sexual exploitation. When you go in and you look at the raw material in terms of the cases and, the, and how those decisions were taken, that gives you, I think that gives you raw, hard, raw evidence to base our conclusions on. Mm. So I think that's been a quite a significant, um, I suppose, intensification of our data gathering exercise over recent years. Do you inform them of your inspections? Oh yes, they get, they don't, all our, all, Does don't, that not claim, would that not make you think that there would be a broom cupboard somewhere where all the skeletons were being placed? Or? Yeah, I think, I think we know the system 
pretty well probably define those broom cupboards at this you, stage. You know the risks. And we know the risks. Um, and the only organisations that we don't pre-warn are the prisons. Like there are, and, and, and other places of detention. So, for example, we would do unannounced inspections of, of the prisons and of the juvenile justice centre and sometimes of police custody and other detention facilities. Mm -hmm. But other than that, we work basically, as you mentioned, in terms of transparency, because we publish our programme. So an organisation will know that we're coming in to do an inspection well in advance. Yeah. Um, we will work in terms of the timeline. We will share that with them. So essentially, we have that openness, and we expect that openness in return. And I think that probably works fairly well in terms of our relationships. Okay, so, mm -hmm. Jack, who's the least best at okay. transparency then? So, um, <laughs> I'm not going to name an organisation <laughs> because, if anything, I think it's much too soon to do that, even if yeah. I was minded to do it. Um, what I can say is that it's not about catching organisations out. It's about creating a culture where organisations are committed and visibly and tangibly committed to, co to continuous improvement. And that really they shouldn't need an inspectorate coming in to shine a light on some of the issues that they maybe know about themselves, um, but maybe haven't had the space or the strategic thinking or the resources to do something about. Um, what I will say is, even at this stage, I think um, some of the things that are interesting for us is that I, and, and for me, I believe that you can fiercely guard and protect your independence, but that doesn't mean that you're not accountable. So I think for some organisations that maybe adopt an approach through our factual accuracy check regime um, and process where they will spend much too long on a lot of micro detail and try and influence how a, a report might be the intonation or some of how something is said. And rather than wasting energy on that, what they should be focusing on are the higher level recommendations and what we're trying to get to in terms of an outcome and a recommendation. So as I say, it's um, a bit early to name and shame and I'm not, I'm not entirely sure I'll ever be minded to do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, but I, I think, there, I think we're, we are fortunate that we do have a justice system because of the level of change yeah. we've all been through and because of the organisations and the leadership in, in the organisations. I think, yes, there's plenty of opportunities and there's plenty of inspected activity that needs to be done, but I think there's a real sense of a lot of people wanting the system to be better than it is. Good answer. Thanks, Jack. Thank you, Paul. That's it. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Good to see you again. And thanks for your time previously in meeting me. Um, <clears throat> just looking through some of the highlights of, of your uh, document that you have before us here today. Um, first of all, I noticed that... Um, You've been in, and you've other organisations <clears throat> with a regulatory pros prosecutorial uh, role inspected by CGA, which interferes with the, C the criminal justice system. Now, those include various government departments, and I also see then, whenever I moved on, that you've been to uh, look at, say, for example, the likes of DERA, fraud investigations, and uh, presumably other government departments. Now, while I see that. For example, whenever you go and investigate or go in to do an unannounced business visit at McGabry, there's consequentially a report. Are there any reports from those visits or those inspections that you do to public bodies as to how they're performing? And um, inevitably, I would say the, the, the light will be shown during the course of the next week on the Department for the Economy and investigations there. So. Um, where where are the conclusions of your reports to, or your investigations to be found in other public agencies, if if they are to be found? Mm -hmm. And the second thing is leading on from that, uh, procedurally, who follows up to make sure that voids, gaps, inefficiencies, <laughs> maybe ineptitude, are attended to? Now, leading on from that, because I've spent my time there too on the Public Accounts Committee. What tic tac do you have with the likes of the Public Accounts Committee, where similar type of work is going on uh, in a different sort of procedural way, but in a much more public and open way? So, mm -hmm. I would be, because you could have two <coughs> parallel, call it <coughs> investigations, through mm -hmm. inspections, oversights going on at the one time, mm -hmm. drawing more or less the same conclusion. <coughs> similar eyes would be going in to, to look at similar skilled eyes going in to look at them. Mm -hmm. But you're doing the same work, so I'm wondering at what point does the overlap take place or the convergence 
potentially for both organisations to do that. For example, a simple thing might be, uh, say for example, we'll just take the first one there on, on the 2nd of August 17, an inspection of DARD, um, fraud investigation and enforcement activities. Would you check out beforehand with the likes of the audit office to say, are you guys onto this or over this stuff? Mm -hmm. It might save us a lot of time, yeah, uh, and a lot of effort. And but and again, the second bit is, while that work of the audit office is in the pu full public uh, glare, openness and transparency abound, and all that, where does where does your stuff go? Yeah, and how is that dealt with? Well, all our reports are published. So any report that CGI has done is on our website. It's um, available to the public. Sorry, maybe Jackie, you're missing my point there. Um, my point is that there's an inspection done on this, say for example, we'll take the first one, uh, into the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development fraud investigations and enforcement activities. While I do see reports, other reports here about McGabbery, for example, I don't see any reference to that in the list here. So okay. are you saying that there's a report available about that? Well, I'm not sure. I'll maybe pass on the specific, yeah. specifics of that to um, James because, as, as I said previously, there's a wide range of reports over a, a long period of time that not all of them, obviously, at this stage I would be aware of. But what I can say with some of those smaller organisations who may take prosecutions through the criminal courts, if there was a thematic inspection that involved a number of different departments, uh, it may not be that there would be an individual inspection report for that particular organisation. It may be a look mm -hmm. at a particular type of crime that are prosecuted yes. through the courts. Um, but on your second part of your question around the Northern Ireland Audit Office, I've met both Kieran Donnelly and Neil Gray from the Audit Office since mm -hmm. I've come into post. And I've mentioned to them and we've discussed about the sequencing. They've obviously set out their three-year plan in terms of, of their reviews, whether it's value for money or other reviews. And what I've said to them, that what I would welcome moving forward is there is better choreography or sequencing around when they're going in to do a review and when we would be going to do a review, or if there were opportunities for collaboration to do some sort of joint review that I would certainly be interested in. And Kieran Donnelly has... has um, agreed that he would be interested and his team would be interested in discussing how that would be done to avoid the type of duplication that you're talking about. So I'm hopeful that in the next programme and in moving forward in our three-year corporate plan period, there will be opportunities to do that because I think there's opportunities for us to learn from the audit office, but also from the audit office. They, they will frequently reference our reports and some of their work. I mean, I'm, I'm acutely aware that their report on delay heavily references work that criminal justice inspection did um, over a long period. So the reference point and where they take that information from is drawn from a lot of the work that was done by CGI in the past. But on the particular issue that you asked about um, a specific organisation. Yeah. I, I don't know, James, yeah. if you're in a good position to. Yeah, with that particular report that you mentioned, which was on fraud investigations in the um, DARD at the time, it was called DARD. That report was published on the 2nd of August 2017. Um, now we do publish all our reports, and, and you're right, we do, we do have a remit which is outside the criminal justice system because it's, it, it relates to bodies which interface with the criminal justice yeah. system. Um, and that was certainly in terms of their investigation and also the old Department of the Environment. We did quite a lot of inspections on, on particularly, particularly on, the, on the waste side, environmental crime. We did two inspections on environmental crime within the old Department of the Environment. Um, and we went to, I remember us going to the, the Environment Committee to present that report. Um, now, I don't think we've been at the PAC, but essentially that, that report of an avoidable delay. They are, like we did, we've done three, report, three direct reports on avoidable delay. Uh, 2006, 2010, 2012. We've, uh, quite a lot of our recent reports have looked at avoidable delay. So we have a lot of information on, on the, on the consequences of delay for the criminal justice system. Um, and I think a lot of that information obviously is is also um, in the in the recent audit office report. Yes. Um, so certainly, you know, there is a, there is an opportunity to sort of have, to um, I suppose have a more con coordinated approach mm. within government in terms of how those recommendations are actually dealt with. Mm. Um, but to answer your question, I suppose, all the, report, all the reports are published on our website. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then the other point I was making, the mechanism for lifting the issues 
from those reports and ensuring that they're that they're followed through on. Yeah. And basically, what I'm saying is the the mechanism between your report and the accountability bit yeah. and the likes of, of committees. Essentially, it's the same. It's the same approach as we would do with a, with a, with an inspection within the criminal justice system, in the sense that we would do the follow. We would do a follow up review of those reports, um, and we um, assess progress against those recommendations. Again, we publish those reports, and again, we're happy to go to whatever committee is particularly interested in that report, and, and we've done that in the past. And then, not that you should need it, but. Do you, if you were to go back in again and find feelings and the similar feelings of the similar extent, what what do you do then? Well, I suppose that comes about that that gets to the critical question which we've been talking about. How do you, um, I suppose, persuade, encourage um, the organisations to actually deliver our recommendations? Mm. I think that has to be. It's. I think that. Responsibility for that lies obviously with criminal justice inspection, but I think there's others as well. There's the, mm -hmm. the organisation themselves in terms of what they're going to do about a problem that they've recognised and accepted. It's about committees like the Justice Committee holding them to account. Yes. Um, it's about the public sometimes holding organisations to account. Mm -hmm. Because our reports, for example, on sexual violence and domestic violence, you know, those reports essentially demonstrated the failings of the justice system for victims. Now, I think for those organisations, it's yep. the general public that's holding them to account, um, as well as just um, formalised committees and, and, and bodies like ourselves. Thank you, Anna. Please, yes, Chair, uh, with your forbearance. There were a couple of three debates in the Assembly at the start of the week, and I presume you were taking a uh, view on them, but um, particularly the issue, the thematic issue, repeated thematic issue of treatment of victims and witnesses cropped up again and again, mm -hmm. and how how particularly older people, um, the outcomes for older people weren't as successful as for other age groups. So I presume that might be something you'd want to look at too. Mm -hmm. um, if I can just mention, um, Mr. Glover, we have a, uh, a report on victims and witnesses at a draft stage at the minute, and I would ha intend to publish that um, certainly within the next two to three months. Uh, and it covers a wide range of issues, um, as James has said previously, in terms of outcomes for victims and their experience of the justice system, whether or not a prosecution has been proceeded with or not. Um, but I imagine there will be a lot of interest. And as I said previously, if the committee would welcome a briefing on that particular report, I'm happy to facilitate that. I think, Chair, that would be very helpful, because some of the stuff that had been provided to us in research from the, the older persons uh, commissioner for older people um, was, was indeed very elucidating. Yeah. And Mr Lynch has written to me, the right, Commissioner okay. has written to me on that issue. And then uh, the other issue, there's a wide range of issues here that you're dealing with at the Hood Chair, was the, the human trafficking and modern slavery. And we raised this with, with the PSNI whenever they were here, and they involved, because there's organised crime, this big, big issue of organised crime, and how, um, this is an observation rather than ask you, but it's an observation that we came up with, how in circumstance where organised crime gangs are multinational, international, some of them emanating from uh, uh, far away as Eastern Europe and indeed uh, further afield than that, but it, it's how in circumstances where we're moving away from um, the EU, uh, where that exchange or that gap and the exchange of information detail in. Mm -hmm. The obverse of that is the protection of rights too. Uh, could be able to see that's been flagged up today in the negotiations out in Brussels mm -hmm. as, as becoming a bigger issue too. So uh, if you could just respect that that aspect of it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had some very sad news stories, particularly in Essex yes. up here as well. Yes. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the, some of the alleged people who are involved in that are, are from mm -hmm. Ireland. Um, so um, I would hopefully you could keep a bit of an eye on that as well, please. Well, again, there will be an inspection report, hopefully in, in the coming months, I'll be in a position to publish that, um, certainly within the next three months or so. So again, the committee may be uh, interested in that report as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, members. Just one other thing. You obviously go through and go around a lot of organisations, and I take it a lot of them are accredited. You mentioned that you're accredited in ISO 9001. Um, do you see evidence of continuous improvement within those organisations? 
obviously that should be the case, you know, if they're accredited. Mm -hmm. And if there is continuous improvement, um, does that give you some sort of an assurance that your management, obviously, are committed towards improvement? And, and, and are you looking then, uh, do you get a bit of a comfort from, from that <coughs> and feel that, well, this organisation is is in the business of continuous improvement and, and in their processes, their procedures uh -huh. and so on. Uh -huh. do, you, do you see much evidence of that within the government agencies that are in many ways, I suppose, heavily into processes and procedures and, and, and as you well know, are led and, and have gone through uh -huh. the quality systems and so on? Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you see benefits from it, yeah. I suppose? I mean, certainly as part of my introduction to this role, as you've noted and I've advised the committee of is going around and meeting leaders of the key organisations and I have to say I'm hugely impressed by the leadership and by the commitment to improvement and to change um, but that's not to say that there aren't areas in particular organisations or across the criminal justice system that need to be improved. We know there are lots of opportunities to do that but what I will say is there's an energy and a focus in you know, many of the organisations and the leaders that, that I've been speaking to, to do just that. Um, I don't know if, James, there's anything you'd like yeah. to add to that, I based I've, on past I, work. Yeah, I've been inspecting the criminal justice agencies now for 15 years, so I've, I suppose I can reflect on what yeah. type yeah. of organisations I looked at 15 years ago, and I think, as Jackie said, as, you know, we can't, you know, even though there's areas for improvement and there's some critical areas of failure, at the same time, you have to recognise that the justice system really has, in many respects, been transformed over the last yeah. 15 years. And I think you have to stand back and give credit to that. Mm -hmm. um, and we know, and we, and in terms of transparency as well, I think it's very important that um, that the general public have a far better understanding of how the justice system operates now than they did 15 years ago. Um, and the organisations are willing, much more willing to engage with the public. Um, and you would see that we, we talk about obviously. The, the frustrations of victims and witnesses, but at the same time, there's been a lot of positive developments in recent years in terms of, you know, transparency and, and support available to people who, who are unfortunately part of the criminal justice system. Um, we know that the prison service, in, in more recent reports, particularly in McGabry, but also in in, in 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 Ash House and in the Young Men's Prison, you know, there's some significant improvements happening, and we're beginning to document that in our reports. Um, and policing obviously has gone through a whole process mm. of reform. So I think it's uh, what I would say is that the type of organisations that I looked at 15 years ago are very different now, and in most respects, actually a very positive change. The challenge, and, and we've talked about that, the challenge essentially is 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 the co is the collaborative aspects. That, that essentially that's the greatest challenge. I think organisations have managed to be able to improve their internal processes but yeah. they haven't really been able to grapple successfully yeah. with having a more joined up approach working with others, working with others other organizations either within the justice system or outside the justice system no, it's, it's a that's problem. that's the challenge and that's where they haven't really moved on in the way that we would have expected them to move interesting so there, there, there's an issue for continuous improvement you know and the, the old thing or the, as you know the whole benefits was about empowering people and taking more responsibility and, and being seen to do that rather than standing inspect doing an inspection mm -hmm. just to empower people to take yeah. on the responsibility you, you're probably getting where i'm coming from the, the principles of quality and so on i've had a bit of a quality background myself in engineering so but that's that's where it's coming from and, and i think in many ways that has transformed things so it is you know refreshing to realize within the organizations you see most organizations have good people in them and they're doing a reasonably good job, but there are parameters, and many of them may be financial, maybe yeah. their management, and so yeah. on and so forth. But mm -hmm. I think, fortunately, within Northern Ireland and even within the government agencies, you are looking at, yeah. and you've said it, you know, there are a lot of good people. Yeah. But there, you okay. know, there are loads of reasons as to why they just cannot d deliver what it was planned to deliver. Okay, thank you. You don't need, I think that was more right, Thanks, Chair. No problem. Can I thank you? Uh, both very much for coming to the committee. Okay. Um, I've, I'm sure that there'll be themes that we will want to pick up at in terms of your inspection reports. Um, there's a number of them um, I think members will be particularly interested in. And previously we did have particular sessions on specific reports. And I'm sure that if you're uh, happy to do that, I'm sure members will want to do that in the future. So I appreciate this has just been a general overview today. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you. All the best.
Okay, members, the next item, um, there's the draft organised crime strategy, and it's on pages 23 to 82. Um, the department has provided a copy of the draft paper, and it outlines a number of areas, so it's there for members' information. Um, it's going to be put out to public consultation, um, and we obviously then will, will want to pick up on that in due course. So if members are content just to note uh, the draft consultation paper. Agreed. Um, Agreed. Correspondence, uh, pages 84 to 145, and then uh, there's one item in the table pack. Uh, I'll just mention a couple of them, and then members may want to, to raise the others. The uh, response of the department regarding whether it intends to bring forward legislative changes to Schedule 1A of the Firearms Order 2004, as proposed by BACSC. Um, the department's indicated that it's considering the merits of the proposal and it's engaging with the PSNI. Um, consideration will also be given to the public safety aspect. So it's uh, to seek agreement from members that we would write to the department and ask for a more definitive timescale than the response that we've been given. Um, for consideration of this matter, and we'll forward a copy then to BASC uh, for information and advise them that the committee has requested um, more specific information. Great. If you're content with that one. Item 6, um, there's a memo from the uh, Public Accounts Committee holding an inquiry into the Northern Ireland Audit Office report on mental health in the criminal justice sy system, asking if the Justice Committee may uh, wish to follow up on this work once the PAC has carried out its inquiry. So, just to remind members, on the 23rd of January, the committee considered the DOJ response to this report. It requested an update on progress to address the recommendations in the report. And if members are content, we'll ask the PIC to be kept informed uh, of progress in respect of their work. Linda? That's it. That's it covered, sir, yeah. Okay. Um, item 7, so then. Before we move off correspondence, Chair, could I raise the issue about the contractors taking the legal challenges? This was brought up at this committee, I think, but it was also brought up at the Finance Committee with regards to contracts. I see that, yeah. It's on point uh, 6.3, correspondence, Yeah. 6.3. If we could pass that letter on to the, to the uh, Justice uh, yes. Minister to ask her for her thoughts uh, to respond. It, it's, it is something that's stifling development mm -hmm. in this country, no doubt. It's not the only thing, but it's one of the most major things whenever a company can stick in 250 quid, get a good solicitor on board, and then a contract or a tender stops, and that works on roads, works on buildings. In fact, it works on any tendering process. So I think it's something we need to explore to see if we need to align ourselves uh, with GB or at least see if we need to raise it a bit. We'll do that. It wasn't one I was going to draw attention to. It was covered in the clerk's memo of how we're going to action that letter that we got from the chairman, and, and we're going to do exactly as you've requested, Paul. So we will uh, forward that and seek a response. Thank you. Um, again, it's still on correspondence. I'm just going to draw attention to item 7. Um, I met with a delegation from the Prison Officers Association based in McGowbury. Um, they corresponded with me, highlighting a number of uh, industrial relation disputes. So it's there to seek a response from the department in terms of the issues that have been raised. That will come back to the committee in due course. Um, then there's item one in the table pack. The prisoner ombudsman has published their investigation uh, into the circumstances around the death of Mr Paul Johnson that took place back in August 2017 in McGilligan. Uh, there's been some uh, media coverage uh, I've noted on that. A copy of that in terms of uh, the findings are uh, available there for members. So if members are content then, we'll move to the Chairman's business. I and the Deputy Chair held uh, an introductory meeting with the Director of the Public Prosecution Service. During that meeting, um, the Director did offer to come to meet this committee on a twice yearly basis uh, to discuss areas of mutual interest. Um, and so if members are content, we'll uh, facilitate that and seek to have the first one before the summer um, recess, and then we'll have one later in the year. Um, any other business? Okay, the meeting then next week, Thursday, 2 o'clock, this room. The meeting is adjourned.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.